The inaugural 2024 Korea-Africa Summit took place in South Korea on the first week of June. KEI Operations Manager Mai Presley sat down with Stephen Sung Young Ha and Dr. Loy Jia Duamoa to discuss takeaways from the summit and other developments in Korea-Africa relations. The first interview was with Stephen Sung Young Ha, founder and CEO of Africa Insight. And welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Mai Presley, Operations Manager at the Korea Economic Institute of America. This has been an incredibly exciting year for those keeping an eye on South Korea-Africa relations. So I've invited to join me today, uh, Stephen Sung Young Ha, founder and CEO of Africa Insight. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. The UN administration is really making a lot of effort to engage the African Union and African countries. So um, kind of my first question is, why Africa and why now? Yes, uh, personally, as a someone who has long advocated for strong ties between African nations and Korea from the civil society level, I welcome the elevation of the meeting from the minister to the summit level for the first time. So let me explain why focusing on Africa and why now is important from Korea's perspective. So why Africa is because in it, it is an inevitable trend in global changes at a time when we must seek collective solutions to the global crisis and Korea's domestic difficulties, cooperation with Africa cannot be postponed any longer. Korea faces several issues, including severely low birth rates and an aging population and stagnant economic growth, which all require new breakthrough. Given Korea's limited land, natural resources, the country heavily, heavily depend on export and import. Therefore, we must continuously pursue positive change in our domestic systems and strengthen international relations to ensure sustainable progress. Especially from an economic perspective, the global value chain and manufacturing bases are shifting toward Africa. Africa. The rise of Africa is already acknowledged by many think tank and experts as an irreversible global trend. So countries that recognize this early on, particularly those with the geographically and cultural context similar to Korea, such as Japan and China, have been engaging in summit level cooperation with Africa since 1993 and 2000, respectively through TCAT and POCAT. Additionally, the recent Effort to the strengthen influence and cooperation with Africa are highly competitive, involving the USA, France, the UK, Russia, India, Turkey, Germany, and Italy. In this context, Korea has decided to strengthen its cooperation with Africa before it, it becomes too late. And why now? Because it aligns with the current UN administration's agenda for Korea to become a global pivotal state. Uh, various sectors, including civil society uh, like me, uh, academia, cultural organization, and mul multiple ministries have consistently called for enhanced Korea-Africa cooperation for a long time. However, uh, due to Korea's geopolitical focus on the four main powers, like the USA, China, Japan, and Russia, cooperation with Africa has often been a lower priority. For instance, only four presidents prior to the current administration have conducted official visit to Africa, typically covering three countries, and this visit predominantly occurred near the end of their terms. Mm -hmm. Given this background, until the previous administration, the new Southern policy, which extended up to India, defined the scope of our diplomacy. However, from the outset, the current government aimed to become a global pivotal state and expanded its diplomatic reach as a result. In December 2022, the UN administration announced the strategy, strategy for a free, peaceful, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region commonly known as, a, as the Indo-Pacific strategy. This strategy includes the eastern part of Africa where the India Ocean meets, making the first time part of, part of Africa is included in a major national diplomatic policy 
except for the country partnership strategy in the national ODA plan or ministerial level initiatives such as the Korea Africa Forum or Korea Africa Economic Cooperation. So consequently, the Korea Africa Summit involved various proposals and decision making process, uh, processes led by the different ministries and the presidential office. office. This effort reflects the strategic decision to expand diplomatic horizons and achieve the current administration's goal of becoming a global pivotal state, fostering deeper and higher level cooperation with Africa in line with the global trend and shift. Oh, thank That's you. my answer, yeah. Yes. And as you mentioned, um, you know, Korea is really focusing a lot on their strategy to become the global pivotal state. And ODA is a huge um, tool of that strategy. How, uh, what is the current role of aid versus investment in Korea's relationship with African countries? Yeah. So basically, uh, I don't think ODA and investment are entirely separated. Mm -hmm. It's really a um, connected one. Fundamentally, ODA should serve as a humanitarian aid and emergency relief fund for the most severely challenged and needed area and people. However, uh, beyond that, ODA should act as a catalyst in areas where regular economic investments are difficult due to economic logic. It should help lay the fundamental uh, foundation framework and create a sustainable ecosystem. The historical failure and adverse effect of the ODA and aid to Africa show that this effort often lacked sustainability because they were not well designed to strengthen local ownership at the first place from the start or start or were overly focused on hardware without adequately preparing the software. Therefore, uh, we needed to uh, we need to approach ODA with a long term perspective, then incorporated the sustainability and paved the way for subsequent investment, which can then create a natural economic environment where ODA cannot reach. In this context, the South Korean government's announcement to increasing ODA to Africa to ten billion dollar by two thousand thirty is both welcome and concerning. Mm -hmm. uh, given that South Korea's ODA ratio compared to its GNI has been lower than the recommended stand standard for an OD OECD DAC member, gradually increasing it to 0.7% is the right direction with the appropriate portion to the Africa regions. Mm -hmm. However, considering that ODA is likely to grow faster than investment in the near future, we need to ensure that this expanded ODA is implemented at, in a well-designed and sustainable manner. Currently, under the South International Development Cooperation Basic Plan, there are seven priority uh, partner countries in Africa where more than 70% of ODA is directed. These countries are Ghana, Rwanda, Senegal, Ethiopia, Uganda, Egypt, and Tanzania. Uh, we need to uh, contemplate whether the current allocation is adequate, mm -hmm. as some countries may need more ODA, while others might benefit more from investments. This consider consideration should be flexible enough to meet the specific need of each country while aligning with South Korea's broader policy direction. So in conclusion, I, I hope that in the future, investment will become more active than ODA with investment amount significantly exceeding ODA. Moreover, I hope to see many successful cases of integrated ODA invest model, investment models. Thank you. I also want to talk about, uh, so mutual growth was continuously stressed throughout the summit and also in President Yoon's uh, ad address as well. So we saw that there were MOUs signed and we did have the ODA, but looking at the current trade volume, um, Korea's trade volume with Africa is still quite low and it's mm -hmm. somewhat imbalanced. Um, more than half of the import share is still raw materials um, coming to Korea from Africa, but Africa is yeah. importing a lot of capital and consumer goods. So how can the trade relationship be made less asymmetrical? 
so in this regard, I believe government policy support is crucial in this area. The fact that trade volume is less than 2% is partly due to natural factors, but it also reflects a lack of understanding and some negative perceptions about the opportunity in Africa among business people in Korea. Although it is difficult to generalize due to the diversity of African countries, Africa is geographically distant from Korea. And currently, the only direct flight from the Incheon is to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, which makes business people who consider time valuable make difficult to easier, easily reach to the continent. Because uh, for example, to the Western side of Africa, it takes almost a day, almost 24 hours more than with a, with a transition, including a transition. So this geographical distance and lack of direct flights or shipping route means higher logistic cost, which are a significant barrier to business. To overcome this, businesses need a deep understanding of local opportunities and potential or access to unique high value resources that can offset this high cost. So currently, these resources are mostly, mostly limited to raw materials. In Korea's business environment that expect efficiency and quick result, it is true that the mutual LAPO needed for patience and persistent long-term investment in Africa, which require a more medium to long-term approach is still lacking in Korea. So additionally, considering the investment risk and unfamiliar cultural context, it is extremely difficult for small and medium-sized enterprise to start their own businesses in Africa without substantial capital and a well-known global brand like the Samsung, Hyundai, LG. So therefore, uh, it is essential to take a holistic approach that align ODA with the subsequent business and industrial connections without compromising its fundamental goals. The Korean government should enhance policy and financial support for new entrants, especially SMEs, to reduce various risks associated with doing business in Africa. The economic ecosystem is unforgiving and, and driven by clear self-interest. From the perspective of, Afri perspective of African countries, why should they choose Korea over, over other partners? Conversely, why, why should Korea pri prioritize African countries than other regions? To answer these questions, it is necessary to invest time in focused communication and business cooperation based on accurate mutual demands and expectations. This requires time to allow for trial and mistake and the process of continuous improvement. Therefore, the government of both nations need to ensure that the private sector can actively engage in this effort to make a mistake and make an improvement. Only then can we can move beyond the current state where Korea largely imports raw materials from Africa while exporting capital and consumer goods towarding a more balanced trade relationship, I believe. So we're gonna move on to more of the political side. Um, so as you mentioned, um, you know, Former administrations have had Africa policy, but it sort of fell between either countering North Korea or kind of gaining support in international forums such as the United Nations. How would mm -hmm. you typify the UN administration's goals for Africa? Yeah, uh, the current administration seems to be maintaining the traditional course of expanding diplomatic and political support to enhance its influence in the international community while also expanding its focus toward, toward more practical economic cooperation aimed at mutual growth and, the, and collaboration. For example, last year, the South Korea government engaged in extensive, extensive diplomatic effort with many African government to secure support for hosting the 2030 Busan Expo among, because among the BIE member countries, a significant number of African nations hold voting rights, making their support crucial for Korea's bid. 
However, Korea only received 29 votes in the final count, which is very low considering the number of votes held by African BIE member countries. The vote was conducted in, you know, uh, secret, secretly, so it's unclear which countries vote, voted for whom, but this result suggests that Korea received very few votes from the African nations. South Korea continues to strive to expand its political and economic influence globally, as evidenced by its invitation to the G7 meeting and recently exceeding Japan in per capita GDP for the first time in the history. In this context, Africa is a key partner. Economically, Africa presents numerous uh, opportunities due to its growing young population, abundant resources, and diverse development and business pro prospect. Currently, Africa account for less than 2% of Korea's, South Korea's total foreign direct investment and export, indicating immense potential for future collaboration and development. Uh, the joint declaration from the Korea-Africa Summit provide insight into the area of particular interest to the South Korean government. Key points from the joint declaration, declaration include uh, number one was mutual growth. The primary focus it is on combining Africa's potential with Korea's advanced technology for mutual growth. Number two, supply chain for critical minerals. There is an agreement to create a dialogue and consultation framework to address supply chain issues for critical minerals essential to the fourth industrial revolution. Number three, infrastructure development. Plans to, plans to increase the involvement of Korean companies in large scale infrastructure projects, such as road and port, supported by expanded official development assistance and export finance from the EDCF. And peace on uh, number four uh, was peace on the Korean Peninsula. Both sides agreed on the necessity of the international community fully implementing the UN Secret Security Council resolution to achieving complete denuclearizations. And number five was education and food security. The declaration emphasized the need for Korean support in various area, area, including education and food security in Africa. So in summary, the current administra administration's Africa policy typifies uh, broadening the approach, maintaining, maintaining traditional diplomatic and political goals, while placing a strong, stronger emphasis on practical economic cooperation and mutual growth. Uh, what do you think were the most significant results or takeaways from the summit? Of course, while the official declaration of the future cooperation announced by the government and uh, Africa Union and head of state is a fundamental outcome, uh, from a civil society perspective, the most significant takeaway is the opening of a new chapter where both sides see each other as an important partners. Moreover, it's more appropriate to, to build a summit as a beginning rather than a end point. Uh, moving forward, uh, the specific of how we collaborate are far more important and require serious consideration and consistent effort, which is a demanding and time consuming process. How we follow up will be crucial. And if we hold a second summit in the future, it will, it will involve a critical assessment of how well the promises and declarations from the first summit were implemented, or if they were just empty word. Therefore, uh, it is essential that the commitment made during this first summit uh, effectively carried out with the governments of Korea and African countries, along with the various businesses and civil society working together to strengthen genuine Korea-Africa cooperation.
Right. So as you mentioned, I did kind of want to touch a bit more on North Korea. So again, um, South Korea really emphasized kind of values-based cooperation, and they did kind of urge African countries to assist them in uh, with the denuclearization of the peninsula and also kind of joining together against North Korea. At the same time, um, we are aware that there are several African countries that do still have uh, relations with North Korea. And kind of a case study of that was Tanzania. So they did enter an agreement during the week of the summit where South Korea will loan them, uh, I think it's $2.5 billion. But we also know that they've enjoyed diplomatic relations with North Korea since 1965 versus 1992 with South Korea. So I'm curious, what do you think? Is this going to be typical of South Korea's approach to African nations that have relations with North Korea? Or how do you think they are going to deal with uh, similar cases? <clears throat> yeah, indeed, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are still many African countries, traditional, no, traditionally and still many African countries with a close diplomatic relationships with North Korea, uh, more so than uh, in other regions. Uh, as South Korea seeks to expand cooperation with Africa based on the recent summit, it is anticipated that there will be a challenge and adjustment in how South Korea engages within the region. Uh, uh, while it is important to uh, while it is important to gather information and counter North Korean influence, I believe it is more crucial for Korea, South Korea to focus on its strengths, our own strengths. So developing long-term differentiated cooperation strategies for each country, ensuring clear implementations and maintaining regular high-level exchange and communication to build trust uh, and to build a trust will be the key. And also winning the heart and the mind of the African leaders and population through the people-to-people -people exchange will, will also be significant. This will foster positive perception of South Korea and leverage this feeling as a valuable asset. So while it might be challenging to swiftly change or exceed the deep-rooted relationship North Korea has cultivated over the many decades, South Korea has significant potential in economic and cultural diplomacy. Uh, fo uh, focusing on what South Korea does best and pursuing mutually beneficial strategy will naturally lead to more opportunity for trusted cooperation. Um, so that's my opinion, basically, and how to how we, we should dealing with the North Korean issues in in African continents. Certainly, and then of course, I think we have to mention China as well. So, how much of Korea's current efforts in Africa could be attributed to countering China? And then, what areas do you think they would have the the most advantage to compete with China within Africa? Yeah. <clears throat> So while it might not be entirely incorrect to frame it as Korea competing with China in Africa, it is a sensitive issue. Uh, Japan and China has been investing and cooperating with African countries through initiatives like TCAD and POCAT, uh, respectively long before Korea, which means Korea can learn from these examples. Personally, uh, I remember my time living in Tanzania and Senegal between 2008, 9, 2011, 12, where local, local people often mistook all Asian for Chinese, including myself. So I frequently had to explain that I, I'm Korean, I'm not Chinese. <laughs> uh, I consider the idea of co uh, competition, uh, I consider the idea of competition cautiously because Africa shouldn't be viewed merely as a better ground for competing foreign interest. Moreover, Korea and China differ significantly in terms of size, population, relationship with Africa, and approaches to cooperation. However, uh, if we consider the areas where Korea excels, I believe Korea's advanced technology, efficient systems, particularly e-governance, e-government, and software and system that enhance the transparency and efficiency are strong point. Additionally, uh, the cultural exchange based on what known as K-culture, 
encompassing various form of contents can be advantageous for us. China's approach is highly government driven, involving large scale investment and significant uh, de deployment of Chinese, uh, Chinese personal and resources. In contrast, Korea's strength lies in the more diversified approach where the government set a framework through the policies and budgets, but businesses, civil societies, academias, and cultural organizations also play significant roles. These people-to-people -people exchange and value creation can be a unique strength for Korea. So therefore, I believe that South Korea needed to conduct a more focused study and anal analyze and analysis in this area. This should include both successful and unsuccessful cases by analyzing the success factor of other countries, including China, in their cooperation with Africa and, fo and following and develop developing these factors, as well as identifying, identifying and avoiding the reasons behind failure or negative ev evaluations. South Korea can create better partnership. So in this regard, South Korea will likely be compared to countries with similar characteristics such as China and Japan. Uh, it is essential to consider different philosophical and mutual understanding aspects that, that can differentiate South Korea in its relationship with African countries. Great. So you mentioned people to people relations, which I think is obviously quite important. At the same time, there are still quite a lot of negative perceptions and stereotypes about Africa and countries, the continent and people within South Korea, um, which affects even business and investment, as well as the lives of mm -hmm. Africans living within South Korea. How do you think um, we can change the perception of Africa within South Korea? Yeah, um, changing perceptions of Africa in general in South Korea is indeed very challenging, <laughs> given the vast and diverse nature of the continent, which consists of 55 countries, and the abstract nature of perception, which is not easily altered once firmly established. However, uh, based on my experiences over more than a decade of advocacy and awareness raising activities in activities on African issues in Korea, I believe the most crucial step for Korea are uh, expanding education and opportunities for direct encounters with Africans. Many Koreans have never visited any African countries and have not received proper education opportunity on the continent. Consequently, there are very few opportunities for deep consideration or understanding. The media also plays a significant role in shaping perceptions. Images of Africa in NGO campaigns and documentaries often depict extreme poverty or primitive and underdeveloped conditions. While these images represent only an exceptional part of the continent and often belong to, a, belong to the past, you know, historical aspect, they are uh, very, still very powerful and tend to be uncritically accepted, uh, reinforce the stereo another stereotype to the Korean people. To address this, I hope the, um, the government can create more comprehensive guidelines. Uh, currently, NGOs and cultural organization, organizations are working to change perceptions through education and cultural activities. Expanding this effort at the government level through curriculum reform, reforms can provide more balanced and in-depth education about Africa from early childhood. Uh, it is also important to offer uh, broad support to organizations involved in related activity and to establish guidelines to, to uh, counteract misleading contents about the Africa from the media or NGO. So by promoting education that emphasized the emphasized the diversity and potential of African countries and creating opportunities for Korean to engage with African cultures and people directly, we can gradually uh, shift to perceptions. Uh, additionally, fostering positive media representation and supporting exchange in various fields 
including business, culture, and academia, will help build a more uh, balanced understanding of Africa uh, in South Korea, I think. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it was um, also a meaningful time for me to, uh, you know, brainstorming and think, think deeply about Korea-Africa relationship again. So thanks for the opportunity. The second interview was with Dr. Lloyd G. Aduamoa, Director of the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Ghana. It's pretty clear that the UNIT administration is making concerted efforts towards engaging with the African uh, Union. So I guess my question is, why do you think Korea is interested in Africa and why now? Well, I think the interest should not come as a surprise. Uh, the world is undergoing tectonic shifts. Uh, for example, for the African continent in recent times, we've seen the presence of the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese are in Africa, you know, trade, uh, diplomatic relations, uh, cultural interactions. Uh, so in a sense, we are seeing an interesting period in human history where increasingly we are seeing this connection between Asia and Africa. And I think the Chinese essentially, um, in many ways, made this quite vivid and intense. Uh, of course, the interest from the Chinese side has been across a variety of, of, of sectors. So trade, for example, um, is key. Uh, the market in Africa, Africa's natural resources, all of these questions. And of course, I think that Korea looks at these realities and given the changes in the world, figures that it's important for that country to also get into the process. Uh, I don't want to say get into the game, but well, in many ways, it's, you, can, you can use that term. So Korea has become interested far more you know, intensely than before, uh, and which is why we are seeing the UN administration uh, beginning to take policy decisions, uh, especially with this summitry, uh, to try to connect with, with Africa. Uh, uh, of course, it, Korea has its interest. And, and of course, I think we'll discuss that as we go along. But I think that this is a new era, um, and, and the Koreans want to, to be positioned in, in a way that allows them to also pursue their national interest regarding the African continent. In many ways, you cannot do without Africa, to be, to be, to be frank. Uh, this interaction that we are having through technology without African minerals, you know, uh, cobalt and the rest of them, the, 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 the sophisticated metals that, that allow us to, to talk uh, and all of that. You find them in the Congo and, and, and in other parts of Africa. So uh, there's a sense in which you can't do away with Africa. And, and so here we are with the Koreans uh, becoming increasingly uh, 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 interested and connected to the continent. Thank you. Yeah, um, as re uh, in regards to the results of the summit, what did you think were the most significant uh, takeaways or results from last week's event? I think that what we are seeing uh, clearly is this shift from what was basically engaging Africa at a level that was not if you like, at the level of heads of state, you know. So we are beginning to see with that shift, um, something that I consider very important. That signals to those of us who are Korea, Africa, Africa, Korea watches, and, and Africa, Asia watches, that signals to us that Korea is interested in engaging the African continent from a level that involves a certain degree of seriousness, you know, in terms of engaging the governments, engaging the leaders of the government, uh, and making that, in a sense, a regular feature of how from, from this point going forward, it wants to engage the African continent. So for me, that is key. The Chinese have been doing that over the last two decades um, through the FOCA, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, and I think that maybe Korea is looking at that and thinks that, well, this should be useful for, for that country. Um, through the FOCAC, China has been able to engage the continent 
along very key policy uh, 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 arenas. Um, so that degree of, of seriousness, that degree of bringing in the heads of state regularly, I think, uh, is, is a takeaway for me, I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you mentioned, Korea is, you know, a latecomer in many senses to Africa. And it seems that uh, to kind of make up for that, they've been addressing a lot of the shared commonalities between their past and other uh, African nations. And something I think you've written on as well is using South Korea as sort of a model for development. And I was curious, how realistic do you think South Korea is as a model for African countries? I would not use the word model as, as a descriptor because I think that the circumstances, the realities that Korea went through in forging its unique developmental processes are such that it will be illogical to assume that these can be replicated. Korea's geographical position, it's, it's given reality during the Cold War. The issues of North Korea, of, of America, this Korean transformation, I think, can serve as an inspiration for Africa. But African countries have their own cultural realities. They have their own histories. They have their own political structure, their own ideation, their own sense of self, their own worldview. These are the things that we need. To, 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 to reconstruct the Africa that we want. And so I would say, and I've always said this in my, in my research, in my writings and all of that, that Korea can serve as an inspiration. Asia can serve as an inspiration, but not necessarily a model. You know, that like a, a cookie cutter, you just kind of go in there and mold. Yeah, so um, one thing that I saw kind of continually stressed throughout discussions about the summit and in President Yoon's speeches as well was mutual growth. And I think realistically, while we can say the summit was an accomplishment and several MOUs were signed, but currently the trade volume, Korea's trade volume with Africa is still quite low. It's less than 2%. So um, yeah. how can the trade relationship be made less asymmetrical? Well, fundamentally, I would say that, you know, the African countries should begin to do their homework. Um, for example, in Africa today, we, we see, for example, in Ghana and other parts of, of Africa, we are seeing a certain deindustrialization. Um, and this has been effectively replaced with this tendency to trade. You know, um, in other words, the trading sector and the service sector have increasingly become important. Said that we see in Africa where production of tangible goods and materials is not taking place, you know. Um, so questions of supply chains, questions of innovation, questions of branding, you know, all of these questions, I think these are things that African countries should begin in terms of their leadership, in terms of their governance, in terms of their government. I think that's the homework that we need to do. Um, so the asymmetry is a function of what African countries themselves should begin to do strategically in terms of the important sectors that they see as being important to them, putting in the personnel, training, putting in the resources. These are the questions that need to be looked at. Of course, on the Korean side, too, uh, there has to be some moral, if you like, um, Consent, some moral responsibility in terms of these issue of asymmetry. The the idea that Korea continues to send us, if you like, manufacturers, while we still send, you know, you know, unrefined raw materials, uh, makes the interaction particularly problematic. And I think that the two, two sides can begin to judge or talk, you know, meet reflect and trying to find some way around this problematic. Uh, and I think that is the way to go, you know. So it's a complicated question requiring policy decisions, requiring action points, requiring discussions, requiring policy decisions that I think the two sides should 
get together to find a way around. But I will put the onus heavily on the African side to, to really get the strategic uh, 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 you know, thinking in place and the strategic maneuvers and, and posturing well oil to be able to, 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 to deal with this uh, uh, needling question, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, you know, we were talking about the UN administration's Africa policy, but obviously there have been former presidents that did focus on Africa, though it typically was either to counter North Korea or gather support in uh, like global forums like the United yeah. Nations. So I'm curious, um, kind of what's the uh, general perception you think are coming from African leaders and nations about the UN administration's attention towards Africa now? Well, as I reiterated earlier, it's a new world. Um, Korea internally faces its own challenges. Of course, it's transformed itself and become a leading <clears throat> industrial country, member of the OECD. But it faces existential questions or crisis. For example, the birth rate is low in, in Korea. That means that manpower to, to sustain and reproduce the kind of fantastic growth that it had in the 80s, 70s, you know, um, is not readily available. Uh, the market globally in the world is, is, has become constricted. China is taking a chunk, the European Union a chunk, America, etc. So I think that Korean strategies in Seoul realize that the grants are shifting and, and would want to engage a region and a continent that has a lot of untapped potential. Uh, of course, the demographics favor Africa for now. We have a, what is called the youth bulge. You know, we, we have a, in Ghana, for example, like other African countries, the youth demographically are dominant. Um, that means that there is, for want of a better word, labor reserves um, um, out there. Uh, there's also a market uh, uh, in here. You know, so I think that Korea wants to really connect with Africa along these, these lines to be able to see how it will survive itself. And also, I think, in many ways, engage Africa in ways that would probably allow how it managed itself to transform to kind of rub off Africa in one way or the other. So there's a certain self-interest in there, but I think there's also some degree of altruism, some degree of, okay, you know, what, what can we do or how do we engage this continent so that if its potential is unleashed, we will be well positioned to to also benefit, you know. So um, from Lee, Lee, you know, uh, when when he was president, to to in fact uh, Kim, all of them tried to engage Africa. In fact, the last president as well, Moon, also tried his bit. So I think that we are seeing a certain evolution of this engagement, dictated by, of course, Korea's own internal realities and also the global. Uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic, geostrategic questions. And, and so I think that that's how we read the events that are happening currently regarding Korea and Africa. Mm, right. I think there's also, of course, the issue of China. So some might view, you know, Korea's activity as efforts to counter China within Africa. And I'm curious, what do you think might be the area that Korea would be most competitive in uh, with China? inside of Africa? I think that the Koreans come into Africa with, in many ways, less suspicion. Um, China had that advantage to um, initially. Uh, Korea does not have a colonial baggage. Um, it, it, it experienced colonialism itself. It, it was dominated and, and exploited, you know. So, on a certain level, there's a certain moral, if you like, connection between the two sides. Um, China, of course, had that too. But I think that increasingly over time, uh, 
the Chinese presence has become a bit of a needling issue. Um, the issues of environmental, you know, you know, degradation, uh, Chinese technology, and and the impact it is having, for example, in Ghana, the Chinese or Chinese, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs have been engaged in illegal mining in Ghana. They brought a particular technology that is having a devastating impact on our rivers, for example. Um, when COVID broke out, we saw the Chinese response to to Africans in, in mainland China and all of that. So uh, there's a sense in which uh, the Chinese advantage is, uh, is, is being questioned, if you like, in terms of the, the way in which it was seen, a certain degree of innocence, you know, that puts Korea in a certain, uh, uh, in a good stead, I should say, because it is approaching the continent with a certain degree of a clean slate. And that, 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 that should be to its advantage. Korea is also, in terms of size, not as gargantuan as, 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 as China is. As one scholar said, China is a civilization pretending to be uh, a nation, you know. Uh, but, but Korea is basically Korea. Um, in terms of its size, in terms of its population, it doesn't present a certain, you know, obvious uh, a danger, if you like, in terms of, you know, smoldering Africa and or African countries and, and taking over and, and that kind of thing, you know. So that's that's an advantage that, that Korea brings to the table. Thank you. And so you noted that um, perhaps the African perception of Korea moving in is relatively positive, but I'm kind of curious about the reverse. So there's still a lot of negative stereotypes and negative perception of Africa as a whole within Korea, um, which affects, you know, businesses might not be as eager to invest because they're uh, perhaps fearful of danger or poverty. And then that also affects the lives of Africans that live within South Korea. So I'm curious, what do you think um, could be done or in what ways could perceptions of Africa within South Korea be changed or improved? I think that's an important point to, that you, you put forward. And as I was mentioning, you, you know, this issue came up when we, you know, read it, and 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 black Africans to be specific, were were treated unfairly in 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 mainland China, especially in Guangzhou and and that kind of thing. So obviously, there's there's this racialization question that we cannot hide, and this is a problem not just with Korea, but but of course with 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 Asia, uh, Japan, China, you know, Korea. These are big questions when you engage the literature. Um, I think that we need to start talking about these things, um, engaging each other on, on stereotypical viewpoints. Um, and I think that is when we begin to talk and to engage each other that a lot of the dubious views you know, regarding either side can be looked at and, and, and probably overcome. Um, but I think that is a major hurdle that needs to be to be tackled and 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 confronted head on. We cannot paper over these questions of the feeling of racial superiority, the idea that black Africans are, are, are less than human, that they are they are less intellectually endowed. The same the same thinking that 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 the Europeans and 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 Western civilization in many ways developed, promoted, that led to slavery, led to, to, to colonialism, led to neocolonialism. These are big questions that, that we need to look at. And in fact, I have recently written uh, a chapter in, in this book on what I call racism with Chinese characteristics. And it's part of the conversation that I think needs to be had. Korea should be smart to hedge uh, or head of these these possibilities because they will come, um, and and I think that we scholars on other side should begin to to reflect on these questions. But I think that increasingly, with Korea and Africa, Korea and African nations, 
I think that once we begin to have exchanges at the level of scholars, at the level of policymakers, at the level of tourists, both countries, both continents, both partners, begin to really skin to skin, skin face to face, begin to interact. I think that we will then begin to see that ideas of bestiality, ideas of, of the other being less human and all of that will begin to dissipate. I recently was in Seoul, visited, you know, Busan was in uh, other parts of, of Korea, engaging their scholars, policy makers. These things, once we begin to deepen them, would help us to deal with this very, you know, worrying ideas, especially on the African side that the world has tended to have. And we need to explore that. We need to fix that if Korea-Africa relations are to go anywhere and, and not repeat the, the historical contradictions that have attended interactions between Africa and other parts of the world. Thank you. Hey, um, actually, so you've answered actually quite a few of the questions already. So I just have one final one for you. Um, I did want to speak to uh, kind of one of the many successes of Korea's outreach has been the Korean wave and kind of the K branding. So K beauty and K dramas. Obviously, Africa has a lot of its own culture to offer. And I wonder, do you think there are any lessons um, African nations could learn from Korea as far as creating their own branding for cultural exports? Yeah, I think I've been studying, you know, Korea, the developmental state idea. Um, you know, Korea was one of the key exemplars. Uh, Singapore as well, uh, Japan itself. I think the key thing is purposive, you know, a purposive approach to questions of economic, you know, transformation, questions of image building and, and all of that. And I think that Korea teaches us lessons about how to go about these things. And this brings me back to the point that I made earlier, that Korea can serve as an inspiration in the way in which it has pep purposefully and, and in a very focused, very, you know, laser beam approach gone about a lot of its uh, uh, key issues from making breakthroughs in technology, making breakthroughs in industrialization, making breakthroughs in greening <clears throat> and all of that, you know. So, yes, <clears throat> it goes back to the question of what Africa's elites and their governments and their leadership really want to do about our, our countries in Africa and to do so in a very focused, clear-eyed manner. Um, and Korea gives us an example with this K-pop, K the K-wave and all of that. In Africa, for example, we have the Afrobeat and then Afrobeats. You know, Fena, Fela Kuti, built, uh, you know, invented Afro, Afro beat, and he had the inspiration from Ghana. What we need now is for the governments to, to understand the, the strategic opportunity that these things offer and build policy around it. This is what the Koreans have done. And I think this tends to be the missing point for, for us in Africa, the leadership, you know, leadership to rise up to the, to the occasion. Fanon made these points about the ways in which leadership has to respond to the questions that history throws at it. And I think that the Koreans show us how this can be done in their own unique way, you know, and, and I guess that, you know, leadership in Africa should um, understand these things. I think the youth in Africa show that they, in many ways, are ahead of the curve. And, and now it's for the leadership to, to more or less find a way to meet the youth uh, on this, on this curve, you know, forward movement, so that you know, in key areas, the African continent can can present the true image of itself, which which I think is what the challenge is. Hey, well, thank you so much. Uh, do you have any last words or comments you'd like to make? Well, yes, I, I think that it's this interaction, this interview shows the ways in which the discourse between Africa and Asia, Africa and Korea, 
is 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 very critical to you know how it is that the parties can begin to interact in ways that are mutually beneficial to 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 all of them you know so i want to say that I, i'm very appreciative of this um at the level of of scholarship we want to continue to you know produce work produce research and i should say that we are building a fantastic uh, Center for Asian Studies, which I had at the University of Ghana, the Center for Asian Studies. Uh, we got a good grant from, from COICA. We got 9 million US dollars from COICA. So we are building a very uh, fantastic edifice to do research on, on Korea, on Asia, and also to do something in, in, in digital technology as well. I mean, I think that institution building is one of the areas to go for the two parties to really build enduring partnerships you know um and for me i think that's the way to go once we build institutions over the long durée both parties will get to know each other better and you know misconceptions stereotypes misunderstandings can easily then be fixed so thank you very much my thank you your team for having me and i look forward to further interaction going forward thank you very much Thank you to both speakers for a richly informative discussion on the summit and Korea-Africa relations. There's a great deal of untapped potential for cooperation between South Korea and Africa, and we'll be sure to keep an eye out for future developments. For a more detailed look at the summit outcomes, please be sure to check out KEI's economic policy analyst Tom Ramage's overview on our Peninsula blog. If you enjoyed this program, you can find more like it at www.keia.org and all of our social media platforms. Thank you again for watching and stay tuned for more career related content.